I wanted to do it all. And Bathwell, she let me. It didn't take me long to realize that Beth's specialness extended beyond her exceptional tolerance for a chatterbox kid who kept returning to her space. Beth had an exceptional knowledge of her family story. That story was inextricably linked to Fiss's story. And there was no one, and I mean no one, no one who labored longer or harder day in and day out to preserve that story for future generations. It is a story that began for me at the banks of the Cumberland River, where in agony of soul and despair with a young child at her bosom, a young mother trekked down the dusty path towards the Cumberland River's edge. As she rushed to end it all, with a fatal leap, a voice cried out, don't you do it, honey. Don't you see the clouds of the Lord as they pass by? Sensing the mother's anguish and fatal attempt, Mammy Vinnie raised her eyes towards the heavens. The old woman searched the clouds for the prophecy of the young child's destiny. And as if reading the heavens like a scroll, she asked the mother, look, honey, don't you see the clouds of the Lord as they pass by? The Lord has need of this child. Now music historian and Fisk alumnus John Wesley Work II offers an even more dramatic rendition of this moment. In his book, Folk Song of the American Negro, the old woman who is called Aunt Cherry foresaw the baby's future with such clarity and exactness that present day historians can only make sense of Work's version of her prophecy by emphasizing that it was supposed. It hastened Sarah to stop, saying to the young mother, don't do it, honey. Wait, let the chariot of the Lord swing low. God's got a great work for this babe to do. She's going to stand before kings and queens. Don't you do it. That woman, that young mother, was Sarah Hannah Shepherd. The child at her bosom was her daughter, Samuela, but everyone called her Ella for short. Born on February 5th, 1851 to Simon and Sarah Hannah Shepherd on the Hermitage Plantation of President Andrew Jackson, Ella Shepherd was born into slavery. Her enslaved parents worked in the highest positions that the enslaved could hold. Sarah labored as head nurse and housekeeper while her husband, Simon, who was coachman to his half brother and owner, Harper Shepherd, would later use his earnings from hiring himself out to purchase his freedom and to purchase that of young daughter, Ella. With Sarah, who had promised lifelong loyalty to her owners in exchange for letting Simon buy Ella's freedom, forced to continue into servitude, Simon remarried. He made a life for Ella and himself in Nashville where Ella was a student of the father of education, black education in Nashville, Daniel Watkins. Decades later, Ella Shepherd remembered her teacher with remarkable clarity. Mr. Watkins gave out each word with an explosive jerk of the head and a spring around the body that it commanded our profound respect. Shepherd continued, his eyes seemed to see everyone in the room and woe be to the one who giggled or was inattentive, whether pupil or visitor, for such a one constantly felt the whack from his long return. When Ella Shepard's father fell into indebtedness six months, just six months before the start of the Civil War, his misfortune meant real trouble for his family. 
he had neglected to manumit his daughter and his new wife, Cornelia, which meant that they were his property legally and could be seized as payment for his debts. To avoid their seizure, the family escaped to Cincinnati, Ohio, where warm and humid summers were followed by bitterly cold winters. There, despite nagging health challenges, Ella attended the city's 7th Street Colored School and took private music lessons. And when she was just 13, her father died unexpectedly, leaving very little uncontested by lawyers and creditors and the shepherd women were left to fend for themselves. To help support the family, young Shepherd sought work as a seamstress, a maid, a nurse, and a laundress, and also performed music at local functions. Despite the hard work, she often went to bed hungry. Destitution drove her shortly thereafter to accept a teaching assignment in Gallatin, Tennessee, where her stepmother had relatives. Now the job had only been a part of what attracted her to Middle Tennessee. Shepard was also drawn to the prospect of attending the fledgling Fisk School. She arrived at the Fisk School in September 1868 with all her possessions in a trunk so small that the boys at the school called it a pie box. Her meager savings could only pay for three weeks room and board. And like many other students, she hoped for some form of financial aid, but was told that no on-campus work was available. Ella had exceptional musical ability. So with the help of friends, she was able to tutor three music students in and around Nashville. For a monthly fee of $4, she traveled across the county's rugged terrain to each student's home on Wednesdays and Saturdays. She recalled running all the way over the rocky rough hills and roads to get back in time for the last tap of the dinner bell. She often arrived too late for the evening meal, forcing her to again go to bed hungry. Although she was often too sick to attend class, she waited on tables and also washed dishes to make ends meet on the remaining days of the week. Now Shepard spent what little free time she had rehearsing with a group of student singers who had first been assembled by Fiss's music teacher, George L. White. A small band of singers repertoire primarily consists of contemporary numbers and abolitionist hymns but it was the songs associated with slavery in the dark past, sung during practice or impromptu get togethers that fascinated their Northern white missionary teachers. At first, the students insisted the songs were private, but after they began trading songs, Shepard introduced them to the now standard Negro spirituals, swing low, sweet chariot, and before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave. As a result of Shepard's early contribution to the singers, White, who was not formally musically trained, offered her the position of assistant music teacher at Fisk. Her acceptance meant that at just 17 years old, Ella Shepard became the first African American to serve on the faculty of Fisk University and she remained the only Black member of the Fisk faculty until 875. The musical cadre directed by White and formerly taught by Shepard was named the Jubilee Singers in honor of the biblical reference to the Jewish year of Jubilee in the book of Leviticus. It was White, Shepard, and the Jubilees whom the university would begrudgingly dispatch across Tennessee the wider South and eventually across the Atlantic to save the school. Despite the real threat of danger posed by crossing the Mason-Dixon line and her nagging illness, as well as student dissent against her departure, Ella Shepard accepted George White's offer to accompany the troop as his assistant. As one of the ever-changing groups, few constant performers 
her writings almost a century now, a century and a half later still, provide an uncanny sense of what life was like as a Jubilee. Their experiences with widespread racial discrimination, persistence despite threats of mob violence and endurance in spite of owning very little. I'm talking about most members had not little more than the clothing on their back and inadequate shoes on their feet. Their accomplishments were nothing less, are nothing less than extraordinary. But even more remarkable than their triumph over harshly cold and damp conditions, as well as the constant travel, was their recognition of their performances as much more than mere entertainment. The Jubilees were aware that they were among the most widely known Americans, black or white, in the entire world. And as such, they were constantly conscious of their roles as ambassadors of the African American and American experiences. No troop member seemed more keenly aware of this role than Shepard, who was one of only three Jubilee singers to have taken part in the original company's tours. The exceptional nature of her personal life experiences, even before her participation in the troupe, made her contribution to the success of the Jubilee singers incomparable. Moreover, her traveling experiences, uh, traveling with, arranging, conducting, and composing for the Jubilees, coupled with her personal, physical, and emotional challenges, exposed the depth of Shepard's commitment. That commitment was not only to her own survival and that of Fisk, but ultimately to the uplift of the Black race through education, music, and mentorship. The sacrifices, hardships, health, and socio-emotional trauma she endured during her tenure with the Jubilee Singers bears witness to her belief in a life and work, in her life and work, as a vehicle for the improvement of the conditions of chase prejudice. Further compounding these challenges were Shepard's many responsibilities, onerous singing, arranging, accompanying, and managing duties. There were treacherous conditions under which she and the troop were forced to perform. Racist diatribes never failed to affront and even frighten Shepard, whose steely composure would be put to the test again and again and again. Shepard would later recall racist incidents as making them terribly aware of the quote, chase prejudice, which was to follow us and which was to be a part of our mission, if not to remove at least to ameliorate, end quote. The countless instances of racial discrimination the troop endured when they traveled were terrifying, especially when they were forced to lay over in small towns. In June 1871, they were stranded between towns, between, between trains rather, in a small town on their, on their way back from Memphis after being surrounded by a mob of, of whites at a local hotel. Uh, George White guided the troop as they retreated to the train stop. There, he stood between the Jubilees and the mob and directed the Jubilees to sing. Shepard recalled, one by one, the riotous crowd left off their jeering and swearing and slunk back until only one leader stood near Mr. White and he finally took off his hat. Riotous crowds were not the only menacing threat Shepard and her fellow Jubilees faced. Cold, wet, rainy conditions were particularly treacherous for Shepard who had been plagued with respiratory illnesses since her youth. Her already failed health worsened while she toured with the Jubilees. Even before the first tour ended, Shepard suffered a severe case of bronchitis with nothing to protect her feet from the damp climate, but a pair of cloth slippers a doctor told her in November, 1871, that she should quote, could not remain in the class longer if there was not a change soon, except I was nursed with great care. Shepard lamented, 
if I am not stronger soon, I shall be compelled to leave. Where should I go? I cannot tell, for I have no home in this world. Pray for me, and I am sure the Lord will do what is best." End quote. Now White refused to allow her to leave and return to Fisk, maintaining that um, after praying, the Lord told him that the Lord did not want the troop to go east without their pianist. Instead, White and the Jubilee Singers waited on Shepherd until she was well enough to travel and they all proceeded together. This demonstration of selfishness, selflessness was typical of Shepherd, as was White's expectation and reliance on her humility and on her loyalty. She proved to be his strongest asset and most powerful ally among troop members. When the death of his wife during the second tour left White inconsolable and in declining health, Shepard's duties were extended to assuming complete control of the company's rehearsal and organization of their programs. By the time of the third tour in 1877, internal feuding was at an all time high. Company members often blamed Shepard for the deteriorating quality of their voices. Shepard too endured extremely fatiguing rehearsals and again failing health. Infection stopped up her ears with fluid causing her to miss cues and uh, misplay sheet music. The toll on Shepard's physical and emotional health caused her to remark on her 27th birthday. The day was quote, one of the saddest I ever knew. The singers worry my life out. Utterly exhausted in every respect from these troubles, she wrote. Shepard resolved to accept the generous offer for her to recuperate in a Dutch hospital for six weeks in the spring of 1878. As she departed the hospital on April 1st to meet the troops, Shepard wrote, "'Twas like leaving a happy home, but I feel he calls me. So I go against the doctor and sister's will with the command to stop after April for good otherwise I shall from all human possibilities be very ill from which the doctor thinks I could not recover." End quote. By mid-April 1878, Shepard's body was so ravaged with palsy that her typically long diary entries were now limited to recording the towns in which they performed and things were about to get worse. The growing disgruntlement of the troop members and the countermandering of FIS founder and President Erastus Milo Cravath, who was George L. White's brother-in-law, led White to offer his resignation. To Shepard's surprise and disappointment, it was accepted. Naturally, Cravath expected her to assume full musical responsibility of the Jubilee Singers. She wrote, the burden musically must fall on me. Mr. Cravath has asked me to stay, but my very soul recoils from it. I can scarcely conceal the utter contempt I feel for today's proceedings. I cannot feel it right for me to remain, yet to go would make matters worse. If I stay, I must face probably fatal results. If I go, I have the hope of regaining my strength. Oh Lord, show me my duty. I can only fall mute before thee. My burden seems too hard. Despite her reservation, she agreed to lead the troop on the singular condition that the tour would end upon fulfillment of the present bookings. Cravath, who had other ideas, resorted to characterizing her as a deserter. 
lamented a heartbroken shepherd. As hard as I worked for seven years, late and early doing extra work to at least be called a deserter, I was compelled to stay. I could not go after being told I would be marked as a deserter by the president of Fisk University. The moment I said, I'll stay, I gave up all hope of life and health. I would lay me down and die. But since he says work, I wish for strength to finish it and no more. More than any other member of the Jubilee Singers, Shepherd embraced the missionary spirit of self-sacrifice, hard work, and suffering as a duty. Her ideals were tantamount to those of white and the members of the American Missionary Association. Numerous diary entries convey the enormity of Shepherd's burden and the magnitude of her sacrifice. When she complained of her duties and lack of recognition, she chided herself, oh, that I could be content to labor on in the field my Lord has honored me with and not murmur or wish for another sphere to be at rest. Often confiding in her diary that she could not endure her share of the work another day, her entries indicate feelings of loneliness and in extreme cases, feelings of despair. During January 1878, one of her diary entries read, I have great sorrow, yet I must bear it alone. There are moments when I wish death might come instead. Facing the real possibility that it could cause her demise when she accepted Cravath's challenge to lead the troops' final showings, a distraught shepherd wrote, I bade my loved ones farewell. Shepherd may have contemplated giving her literal life and service for the cause of Black education. Now, fortunately, she did live. And she went on later to important phases of her life. She spent 11 years with the Jubilee Singers as the sole piano accompaniment for the troupe. She taught music lessons between tours. She built a home within view of Fisses Jubilee Hall for her family in Nashville. And in 1882, she married George Washington Moore, a Fisk Theological Department student and cleric of the school's Howard Chapel. The Moores lived for a period in Ohio as George Moore completed his Bachelor of Divinity at Oberlin College's Theological Seminary. But after his graduation, they moved to Washington, DC, where for 10 years, the Reverend Moore pastored Lincoln Memorial Church and was professor of biblical history and literature at Howard University. The Moors used their pulpit to lead a successful crusade against neighborhood saloons helping to transform their quote, hell's bottom community into one of the best sections in the district. The couple welcomed three children. In 1892, George Moore assumed uh, American Missionary Association post that allowed the Moors to return to their home in Nashville where they lived along with their extended family. Now, George, uh, Moore also served on Fisk's board of trustees. And so the Moore family increased in prestige and in visibility and in renown. The Fisk faculty had had only one black faculty member since Shepherd Moore had taught there. Uh, she did not return to the instructor position that she had vacated to assume uh, assistant directorship of the Jubilee Singers. Uh, but Shepard Moore did, however, remain active in the school's musical undertakings. 
including the training of new company of singers in 1890, helping to drill a chorus during the summer in 1898, and assisting with the guidance of the Jubilee Club established in 1899. Uh, Shepard Moore busied herself um, in support with her husband's missionary work and with community initiatives of her own. She was a prominent leader in social and benevolent work in Nashville and um, nationally. She presented a paper, uh, Missionary and Temperance Work in the District of Columbia before the World's African Congress and another paper, What Congregational Women Have Done for Uplifting the Negro before the Women's Congregational Congress in 1893. She represented Fisk in 1898 the Congress of Congregational Churches in Tennessee, serving as the president of the Women's Missionary Unions of the Tennessee Association for almost a decade. She was an accomplished speaker, researcher, and spokesperson on the conditions of Blacks throughout the South and a regular lecturer at Fisk, Atlanta, and Strait Universities, Tuskegee and Emerson Institutes, and Talladega College. She authored American Missionary Association pamphlets on the effects of slavery and spoke out on its evils as a platform speaker on several occasions. Lest we forget the darkness of that night while witnessing the dawning of a better day, wrote Shepard. The veil of Christian clarity must be lifted high enough to catch a glimpse of the so-called divine institution known as slavery. Shepard Moore noted the precarious role of black women, quote, the cruelest results of that iniquitous system fell heaviest on the defenseless head of the Negro woman who was required to fill every vocation and relation to the white race from the most sacred to the most unhallowed and brutal. Shepard Moore, quote, possessed exceptional power in a rare sweet voice declared an AMA resolution in her honor and never failed to greatly interest her audience and to touch both the minds and the hearts of those with whom she came into contact. She was the quintessential progressive woman of her era. While living in Washington, DC, uh, George and Ella Shepard Moore had socialized with other prominent African-American leaders such as the Grim Keys, Mr. and Mrs. Frederick Douglass, Mr. and Mrs. Booker T. Washington in Nashville. Shepard Moore's womanist sensibilities were not only evident in her writing and speeches, but also in her keen interest in the advancement of women. Um, this was apparent in her club memberships. In addition to being a member of the National Federation of Afro-American Women, an organization that boasted the memberships of Mrs. Booker T. Washington and Ida B. Wells Barnett. Shepard Moore was a founding member and one of the premier leaders of the National Association of Colored Women, working alongside Mary Church Turo, Charlotte Grimke, and Alice Moore Dunbar. She also welcomed that organization to the Fisk campus and to Nashville for its very first meeting. Now, in early 1914, Shepard Moore became gravely ill while at Trinity Schools in Athens, Alabama, where she delivered the school's commencement address and sang in bright mansions above the last song she would ever sing. She immediately returned to Nashville suffering with acute appendicitis that proved too advanced to treat she died of sepsis on the operating table of the neighboring Hubbard Hospital on June 9th, 1914, at the age of 63. Her death was just one day, one day before her youngest son, Clinton, graduated from Fisk University, just one day. She fully understood the limitless potential that the future would hold for the countless lives she touched with her fierce determination throughout her life. Not least among the beneficiaries of her mission and vision were the members of her own family. 
She financed her sister Rosa Shepard's education at Fisk. Rosa would go on to marry William A. Caldwell and worked as a teacher and community activist. George Moore's niece, Elizabeth B. Moore, also graduated from the Fisk Normal Department. She went on to pursue a career in teaching and was a decorated school principal. The Moore's uh, son also attended Fisk, George Shepard Moore, the eldest became a physician and surgeon and served as chair of the Mental and Nervous Diseases Department of Meharry Medical College. And little Clinton, Russell Moore, a World War I veteran moved to New York City where he was an entrepreneur. Added to their ranks was George uh, Shepard Moore's wife, Julia Merrill Moore, who served as dormitory director at Fisk for nearly two decades. Their son, George Seymour, attended Fisk until he died in an automobile accident during his sophomore year, while their other son, Gordon H. Moore, also attended Fisk for a few years. Their daughter, Julia Moore Hoffler, received both her master's and bachelor's degrees from Fisk before enjoying a long career as Professor Emeritus of English at Elizabeth City State University. Her sister, uh, Daily Moore Madison graduated with a bachelor's degree before earning a master's degree in social work and serving as the assistant director of the Metropolitan Welfare Commission until her death. The Hoffler's daughter, Jackie Hoffler Hudson and son, William Hoffler Jr., both graduated from FIS. They shared their graduation year, 1965 with their cousin and my friend, Beth Madison Moore. In 1970, Beth returned to work at her alma mater, Fisk University, and five years later, she began her career as a special collections librarian under the tutelage of Anne Allen Shockley, whom she succeeded. For more than 40 years, in book stacks and, and in archival boxes, processed with her own two hands without recognition beyond the preface of author's books, acknowledging the great debt they owe to her as both a professional as an, and as enthusiast, without great compensation, largely without even occasional recognition or award. Beth freely gave her experience on her expertise on the Black experience to others. No matter if said researcher was an expert of worldwide renown, a college student writing a term paper, a novice or enthusiast asking random questions about something of which they were not quite certain, or even grade schoolers in search of a photo to put on a Black History Month project board, Beth treated us all the same. Her gatekeeping was unlike most others. Not only was it dutiful and diligent, it was also unbelievably kind, as was she. As the caretaker of priceless Fiskiana and African American archival materials, she knew the location of everything everyone was seeking. And she was confident that those materials would be safe in a borrower's temporary care. That doesn't mean she didn't know their value. They were priceless. To Beth, every researcher's work was as priceless as her archive. And to me, she was priceless too. She is the reason why I am telling you this story. She took special pride in painstakingly processing a number of FIS's more than 100 process collections, including the FIS Jubilee Singers collection from which much of this talk's content was sourced. Like her great grandmother before her, Beth House, my friend dutifully, diligently, and lovingly left a legacy, a legacy that positioned so many others to likewise create their own. So as I close, I ask that you always remember that long before Ella Shepard was Ella Shepard, 
And even as we are yet realizing Beth House was Beth House, remember that being honored while wonderful. is not as enduring as being honorable. <sighs> when fortunate to experience the two together, it is infinitely more rewarding, not only or even principally because the former is well-deserved, <laughs> but rather because of all the people who remained and remain deserving despite being looked over. Let us not forget the treasure that is the library and the librarians and archivists who power its service. Let us not forget Ella Shepard and all Jubilee singers past, present, and those future. And let us never, ever forget Fisk. May she live forever. Thank you. <laughs>